Greetings once again. Tesla this week, through Elon Musk, did a tour of the Giga, excuse me, the tour of the Model 3 factory on CBS. And we kind of review what was shared, both good and bad, and uh, perhaps some conclusions on what we came through from that. The second thing we covered today is a review of pricing on the semi-truck that seems slightly illogical, but uh, we'll dive into it and take a closer look uh, for some insights. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Um, if this is your first time on our channel, please take time to like and subscribe. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. We could really use some help on Patreon to do a better job of everything we're doing. And uh, folks like you are the, the difference between better or worse quality of execution. So today's talk starts out as I've done before, where we're kind of in the field in motion. And I know it's noisy, I know the picture's shaky, but you'll see the logic to it. We're gonna spend about uh, 90 seconds uh, going over the facilities here in Texans Corner, uh, Virginia. So first, um, I wanna do a quick look inside the showroom. Uh, So we're taking a look at sort of what's displayed right now. Um, as you know, for the structure of our parking lot here for our service center in the Washington DC area, by the way, this is one of the ugliest buildings I've ever seen <laughs> in Tyson's Corner, but it obviously is hot in terms of uh, you know, those colors just look horrible to me. Your, your opinion would be interesting. So the structure of the parking lot here is that we have, um, these are the, uh, the test vehicles that uh, if you're in the area, you get to drive. Um, obviously two Model Xs. Um, and then this is the collection of Model Ss that, uh, that, that are uh, the vehicles that you would normally get to test drive. We then get, in, uh, we then get into, um, these are the vehicles. Uh, we're not quite at the spot where the vehicles being serviced are being viewed. Um, I'm told that these are the loaner cars so that if you have your Model S in service or your Model X, uh, these are the cars typically that you would end up using. And then as we get to the end of the row here, um, this is typically, I know we take a quick look of what's going on in service bay. So these are kind of vehicles that are being serviced currently. And then uh, at the end of the row, we typically end up with service vehicles that were too numerous to put them inside the building. And then we get over here to sort of see what else is going on. Um, I can see a mobile service truck uh, for Tesla there. And um, interestingly, obviously no Model 3s. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of gives you a flavor for um, what the service center is looking like currently. I'm going to go ahead and uh, avoid heavy commentary until I get back in the car because um, most of my viewers typically don't like the, uh, the bounciness and we also don't have... Uh, um, yeah, good morning, Bob. I didn't see that. Um, I want to also note to you guys that we typically... I was saying hello much like other channels when possible, but I'll probably refrain from that in order uh, to, to uh, not interrupt the flow for when we have the larger number of non, uh, you know, non-live folks that are viewing. So I can see your comments and please fire your questions, happy to respond. I, I just wanted to pit stop real quick here and take a look at this. Um, you know, one of the one of the fun things to view if you're a car nut is notice the red uh, the red inside, um, it, both for all the supercars and Ferraris and all that stuff. We start to get into sort of racing and and really hardcore calipers. So I expect us to be in the racing model here, and we are. <laughs> so instead of trying to look at what the nameplate is on the car, you can simply. We're at a P100D here, 
and this is clearly the uh, racing version and I can tell that because as soon as I see those red, that red in the caliper zone, I know kind of what the deal is. So uh, no, I did not see any Model 3s that are in service at this point. Uh, from what I've seen, there are barely any in the DC Washington area. And now I'm jumping back in my ICE vehicle so you guys don't have to give me a hard time because I said that's what I have currently, but we have the Model 3 on order. Um, so. This is great for Tesla Fan Insight. Uh, my goal here is typically to give you guys a quick look at sort of what's going on around and you sort of know the environment. I like to visit the uh, service center maybe once a month, month, month and a half. Um, uh, uh, so um, I'm uh, wanting to sort of move forward here. Uh, Hopefully I'm not bl uh, blowing you guys out in terms of the, uh, I think maybe I'll back up and put the the uh, the facility behind me so that you guys can have sort of a Tesla's view uh, that you're looking at versus looking backwards into a blast of sunlight. So let me do that. So I uh, the big change that I've noticed in this facility is frankly they had images on the walls of sort of the integrated Tesla solution so basically you had a situation where um, they were really emphasizing the power wall attached to the solar panels attached to your vehicle and that's changed now that the plan is to move the sale of solar um, the solar home stuff into Home Depot and sort of get rid of it here um, I, uh, you know, I guess I don't have an opinion. I think that there's a lot more sales that you could achieve if you use a facility uh, that's not, um, you know, I, I think it's a good idea. If they sell well, they'll keep it. If it doesn't sell well, they'll move on. Um, I don't have an opinion on that. So let's move on to our discussion for this week. So the first uh, thing I wanted to cover is the fact that um, there, the Model 3, there's good news and there's bad news about the Model 3 factory that we picked up on this week based on what Elon Musk uh, described. The good parts, uh, number one, he announced that uh, 2,070 vehicles were produced this week, which is good. Uh, number two, um, you know, it's not virtual. They actually have cars moving and they're getting produced. Um, the other positives are it's nice to have Elon on the facility and you know keeping an eye on what's going on with production. The negative side of that is that um, if he has to be there, it really means that there are some decisions that are bet the company or billion dollar decisions that he has to make. And he can't make that uh, um, without, a, uh, uh, without being on site and having hands in. Now, we kind of get into the how do you assess his comments and it's sort of part of the reason Tesla Fan Insight exists is some of the things that Elon says and does reflect good business but make no sense. So the first thing he shared, uh, I thought that was substantive that's worth reviewing, is he pointed out that um, he felt that uh, humans were underrated. So they've decided to... Um, I think temporarily increased the number of factory workers that are working on the Model 3 as a way to get product out the door, um, but they have to figure out how they're going to rebuild in order to get um, up to the five to 10,000 units per that is the goal of the company. Um, I His comment was basically that we tore out a bunch of uh, the the conveyor belts we had were torn out and therefore we're replacing them, if you will, temporarily with human workers in order to get the production done. Now, if you look at all the pictures that have come out, we've never seen any conveyor belts. So I think that he also commented that they were over-reliant upon um, uh, robots and um, robots are ubiquitous in all the factories now, including Tesla's. So I don't think that flies real high either. Um, Really, there's a concept called KISS in business, which stands for 
keep it simple, stupid. So what KISS is about is the fact that if you have smart people that work hard, you can actually come up with solutions to problems that are very complex. And in the case of Tesla, it feels like there's been a violation of the KISS rule. And the main thing that I noticed that I thought was interesting and wondered how it would work is if you watch the video and I'll attach it from CBS, you'll notice that as the vehicle is moving or car parts are moving, Tesla has a constraint of the, the uh, amount of land they're working with. So instead of putting an assembly line in a row, um, everything has been forced to be stacked very high. And so this is no problem for a robot because robots can operate at whatever height that you, you place it. You know, parts can move it at whatever height you place it. But the problem is when you have human beings and they have to replace uh, the, uh, they have to replace the machines as they're doing their thing. Now you have the problem of how do you get human beings into spaces that height-wise, et cetera, have been set up for robots to operate at those heights? And so as I watch the cars moving um, on, the, on the line by you know, the camera, I just got a real sense that there was a, um, a problem of if the robots don't work and you've set up an environment that are robot-friendly, that are not people-friendly, how do you replace those robots with people when it doesn't work? And the answer is production has slowed down and they're trying to figure out what to do. Based on what he shared, I think 2,500 a unit um, uh, 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 greetings from South Africa. Um, I wanted to note that based on what I saw, I think 2,500 is a no brainer in terms of units per week based on where they are now and they're maintaining it, which is good because I thought they may have gotten up to 2,000 units and then they dropped back down to about 1,400, which is what the average had been. The real question mark is that based on what he's saying and kind of what I'm seeing and what I just said, I think 25,000 units by June-ish is, uh, would be a miracle. And the only way they get there is probably build a new production line and ship it, you know, have the cars assembled nearby in another building. Because I don't see how you, given the nature of the problems he's described, I really don't see how they're going to pull that off. I, I think that um, it'll be hard to do, um, but I think it's possible. But given the nature of the problems they have. The other problem that popped up in my mind was... If you had planned this whole thing out based on a 25% margin and you were using robots, you know, over time, what happens when you introduce a whole bunch of people at $30 an hour uh, times the number of people and now you have to pay people that you weren't expecting to pay before? How does that affect your margins? So uh, the, stay tuned. Those answers will be coming forward and uh, we don't have the answer to that. In general, though, I think it's good news that we're at 2,000 units 2,070 units a week right now. I think um, within the next uh, couple of weeks, 2,500 is attainable. Uh, is more than that possible without a major rework? I don't think so. And so I think that, you know, maybe 3,000 units a month by June is um, very doable, but I ain't seeing no 5,000 units. And that could create financial problems, et cetera, if we aren't in that 3,500 to 4,000 units by mid-June zone. So stay tuned and we'll see what's happening. The next thing I'd like to cover today is sort of what I call zany pricing on the semi. Um, the, uh, the, the next thing that, in the case of the semi, what I wanted to say is that, so when the semi first came out, the pricing on it was known, 150,000 um, for the 300 mile, 175, for the 500 mile and the founders editions are going for $200,000 a piece. Now here's where the zany pricing comes in, which I think is kind of amazing, interesting. So um, the first sort of uh, day or few uh, that came up was that um, there was this phenomenon of $5,000 down and you get to get in line and that lasted two or three days. Then Tesla announced that they were increasing the initial fee to two or $20,000 per truck. Now, I thought this was really weird because if you look at the Roadster to secure 
a line in to get a two hundred thousand dollar roadster, you had to put down fifty k. And so I was thinking to myself, wait a second here, you have a two hundred thousand roadster, you got to put down fifty k, but you have a two hundred thousand dollar truck, and now you don't have to put twenty k down. So, you know, uh, usually Tesla is very well organized on everything, but. For an important thing like how much cash is going to be sitting around waiting on production that you know etc i think that they're making a mistake on it obviously um this is also an interesting phenomenon because nikola just announced that they no longer need a deposit you just have to put your name on the line that you're going to be purchasing and you can have a vehicle now i think this sounds really desperate because if you have a product where you go from five thousand to twenty thousand dollars in reservation prices. Um, I think it's a sign of how strong demand has been, and you know they're sold out anyway. So you know any but new people getting in line, they could charge them fifty grand, but they're so far down the the production line, it's almost a waste of time. But they could use the operating capital basically. Um, Nicola has also pointed out that we don't need to use your cash because we have $8 billion in deposits. Um, we don't need to use your cash, so therefore we can return all those deposits and go from there. So I, it, it, Nicola is representing themselves as being really credible. I do have a show coming up in my truck uh, analysis that suggests that, um, you know, if if you watch the process of how trucks are done in terms of like right now, uh, Tesla's not doing this, but in Germany, Daimler-Benz has a process going where all their trucks at the longer range get an engineering team behind them. So three to five trucks are out there. Each of them have three to five people that trail the truck everywhere it goes to see what the customers have it doing, what the truck is doing, how it's performing. Now, I just think this is smart because you collect all that data and it allows you to build a better product so that all the other large scale numbers can be known. In the case of Tesla, as you can see, um, there are two trucks that are on the road generating a lot of miles and doing legitimate deliveries under stresses like 7,000 uh, foot high mountains. And those are the kind of environments that suggest that you know these guys are on it. The only thing I don't like about what they're doing is that I'd love to see Tesla running like Daimler does a few people behind the vehicles so that all the data, you know, visual data in terms of video, along with um, data in, in terms of uh, data being spewed by the truck, you know, can be known. But, um, and then the other thing I am bitching about, I've said this before, is why not let the truck go into a customer hands and let the customers, particularly the biggest ones that have announced their purchases, get after doing what they're going to do so i'm uh that's a mystery not worth uh the time to cover so in general um it looks like model three numbers are good not great and are getting better um i'm a little worried about whether or not the adding of people does help you get uh, units out the door and closer to scale so you can start making money on the cars but on the flip side you're now increasing headcount which you weren't, didn't anticipate in your calculations as you were putting this together. So therefore, you know, either break even takes longer or, you know, we'll see what happens in that regard. Um, I wanted to, on the back end, sort of review a few items. First of all, we've been putting ads in. Typically our ads are once every five minutes or so. Uh, we'd really appreciate your taking time out to watch the ads versus skip them. The big channels can force you to watch. The smaller channels aren't allowed to by YouTube and as a result we don't generate any revenue when it pops up and you simply pr press the skip button so we'll target putting in a number that you'll watch and I'll, I've asked uh, Google to refrain from anything more than 30 seconds but we'd really appreciate your taking time to watch even above that uh, supporting us on Patreon Tesla Advisor um, would be greatly appreciated um, again allows us to do more and um, really, uh, you know, keep the channel growing, growing and going, um, equipment changes, etc. cetera. Um, the uh, final note I wanted to make is that this is Sunday. Um, we, we, did, we avoided Saturdays. Some of our Jewish viewers noted that it was their Sabbath, and therefore we avoided that day. 
um, wanted to get your input on which of the weekend days might be better for us to produce if you have any ideas in that regard. Um, I, you know, after visiting the facility I'm at numerous times, you know, the, one of the things that I was really fascinated by that popped up this week is that I try to visit the service facility once a month and I next need to go to the showroom and see what's going on there. One of the sort of, not a huge deal, but minor deals that are going on with the Tesla facilities is that I'm averse to Tesla not having a dealership network because they're strapped for cash already and uh, because they can't sell the cars to the dealers and then have that cash immediately, it's a tough slot. Um, one of the other sort of little things that's popped up that I've noticed is that if I go to the, the selling facilities, the turnover is really high. So from what I can tell, they're losing salespeople like once a month, maybe every 40 days. And so it takes time to train people and then have, been, have them being effective in introducing the vehicles. So another element of not having a dedicated dealership and therefore not having uh, enough cash to pay people is that you have to go for the least trained people and in an expensive environment like the Washington DC area, those people can't afford to stay based on how little they're being paid. And, so, and, and from what I can tell, there's basically no commission on the car. So I'm seeing like 100% turnover at least every 120 to days to six months. And I'm concerned because one of the, I gave one of the salespeople a little exam and they flunked. And the exam I gave them was that um, about uh, three weeks ago, if you look back at our shows, you'll notice that I went to the Washington DC facility and they caught me in the act of filming inside the Model 3 that was there and sort of booted me out for filming. And so I asked the salespeople before I was booted out, I said to them, uh, could you give me the details on the dual motor Model 3 that's coming out? Because Elon Musk said that it was going to have um, an air suspension. Um, as you guys know, I've been focused on air suspension because it allows you to create an SUV. You can just elevate the car, get more clearance with that four-wheel drive, and now you have a Model 3 SUV that you can run around in when it's heavy snow or if you want the performance. And the, uh, the salesperson that I dealt with, which I think was maybe a 45-day in an employee based on the number of times I visited a facility, was like, nope, it's not happening. We're doing steel springs for the, um, for the shocks in the Model 3 right now, and that's not going to change, and we don't have anything new on that. So what happened this past week? It came out that the Model 3 was available, was coming out, and they're testing it right now with the air suspension. So it, this points out one of the problems with having people who are fresh off the boat, don't know much about the car, and then you keep changing those people all the time, the quality of information may not be as high as it is when you have a well-trained long-term people that were there. Um, so uh, the one other last thing that I want to get into, and I'm going to ask you guys a favor on this, and that is for those of you who are Model X or Model S owners, or even Model 3, I wanted to de start developing a database uh, for your vehicle that we can all see so we can note, okay, at X number of miles, these people are having these problems. Um, you know, uh, I, I will figure out how we're going to do this database. I think on our Tesla Fan Insight uh, web or dot com uh, site, you know, we'll start collecting what you guys start saying are, are the issues you've had, et cetera. We know the door handles have been a nightmare. We know, for example, at 6K, if you want to off warranty buy a, a motor for your for your engine. Um, thank you. Uh, I just saw the comment that you shipped past. Yeah, that was an interesting note this week. Um, Tesla has been doing certified um, uh, refurbished vehicles where they take the car in, fix everything, and then put it back out there for sale, and then, you know, with warranties. And so it's kind of interesting to note that they have a bunch of cars coming off lease as people are moving into Model 3s or other vehicles, and they're sort of shifting what they're going to be doing in that regard. Um, this report came out. I'm kind of, the, I saw the report. I felt like I was a little confused by it. And the main reason I was confused is like if the car comes off lease and you, they want to put it back out on warranty without it having to go through a lot of constant repairs. Um, 
I think they've been monitoring the car in terms of how it's been re repaired already, and they can simply make whatever repairs are necessary or big changes so that they'd be comfortable about it being under warranty again. So I saw that report, and the coming off lease makes sense. Um, I do think that they're going to continue the process of sort of, you know, quick changes of things that um, are routine problems so they can get it back out there on the road and sold without just carrying inventory that, that can't be sold. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But I do think there are a lot of people getting a good car at a good deal. And so I don't, I'm, I'm not hugely stressed by that. At any rate, um, we're at our 25 mark. Um, I get shut down by YouTube in about four minutes. So I think it's good for, for us to uh, call this a day. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. Uh, if you're first time on our channel, please like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon so you don't miss anything. Uh, we typically produce three shows a week. Our next one will be on Tuesday, then on Thursday, then on Sunday again, or possibly Saturday if you guys suggest that the, you know, one or the other day is a better one to go on. Also, would love to find out if you have any questions that we need to research uh, that you think would be good to uh, um, add to our channel in terms of answers. Um, wanted to thank our friends from Europe, South Africa. Um, obviously, it's way too early in America for most people to be getting a hold of us. But I want to thank you for joining us. Um, uh, tschüss, mach's gut, German. Au revoir, French. Um, uh, adios, Spanish. Um, uh, ciao. Just met some folks from Brazil. Um, and uh, Lahit Raut, uh, Hebrew. Choda Hafez, um, Farsi, I'm told. Uh, this is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight and look forward to our next opportunity to spend time. Have a great day for now, and we'll look forward to your comments.